Well, so good evening, everybody. We have um, a true hybrid presentation style this evening. We've got folks here with us at the History Center in the audience, and we have a um, good sized group of folks participating uh, from home, which is, and of course, our speaker is the farthest away. She's in North Carolina. So we're happy to have uh, Marcy Cohen Ferris with us this evening. And I'm Ann McCudden, I'm the director of the History Center. And um, Amelia's got that smiling picture of her. She's actually just off to the side at the command center. So thank goodness for that. Um, we're excited to have uh, Mercy with us this evening. And so, you know, every spring and fall, March and September, more or less, we have a lecture series, a lecture program. And we always try to have a theme going with it. And so this year, actually our second lecture was gonna be last week and we have to scooch that to November. I'll explain that in a minute, but our theme this fall is about food, eating, Southern foodways, all that good stuff. Who doesn't like that topic? And so this evening's um, lecture, of course, is about that. It's about, uh, Marcy's going to present to us on not just her book, The Edible South, but on Southern foodways. And again, our, our Do You Remember, which has now been pushed to November, is going to be about Thomasville restaurants. So pay attention for that one. That'll be fun. We'll probably do a hybrid again because of COVID. Um, but let me introduce Marcy and we'll get going. And again, use the chat for questions or comments. I mean, you can use Q&A or chat, but use the chat. Um, if you want to say hi, have a question, Emilia, Emilia will be manning that and we will get to your questions at the end. So we have with us this evening, all the way from North Carolina, uh, Marcy Cohen Ferris, who is the Emeritus Professor in the Department of American Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill where she serves as an editor for Southern Cultures, um, a quarterly journal of the history and cultures of the US South. She's also the author of, as we mentioned earlier, The Edible South, which is for sale at the bookshelf downtown. Right. And of course can be bought a number of other ways, I'm sure. Um, and she's also written a number of other books. I know I had a couple people email about, oh, she's the one that wrote Matzo Ball Gumbo and things like that. So. Um, she's been nominated for a James Beard Award in 2006. She's the co-editor of Jewish Roots and Southern Soil. Um, she also received the Craig Claiborne Lifetime Achievement Award from Southern Foodways Alliance. Her forthcoming book, I don't know how she'd have time to do this, but I guess she has time for another book, um, is coming out in the spring of 2022, Edible North Carolina. I think we can all just go ahead and get Amelia a copy of that. Yes, a Journey Across a State of Flavor which will explore the vibrant contemporary food, food movement in the Tar Heel State. And um, just to let you know, those of you at home, sorry, but we actually have a delicious cake at the end of this lecture that we're gonna sample, thanks to Amelia. So um, that's okay, you guys can probably, maybe she can get you a recipe and make it on your own. So without further ado, let me turn the microphone over to Marcy and she can take it away. Okay. Anne and Amelia and everyone who's joined us tonight, thank you all so much. I wish I could be there with y'all because I love Thomasville. I've spent a little time there and, and hopefully at the end, I'll show you just a few pictures of, of my former visits there with my husband, Bill Ferris. And I hope y'all can hear me okay. Um, and it's just really a delight to spend time with you. And Amelia is a former student of mine. I adore her. I think she was in some of my earliest classes when I first started teaching at the University of North Carolina, I'm really proud of her work in public history and the work that she's doing in Georgia. So I'm gonna take y'all on a, just a little bit of a journey, you know, kind of over the arc of Southern, of the intersection of Southern history and, and its food worlds. Because, you know, I think when you examine the history of food in the American South, it is complicated. We encounter the tangled interactions of its people over time. You know, it's a world of relationships that are fraught with conflict, yet they're bound by blood and attachment to place. And we know that deeply across the region. There are contradictions between plenty, and we certainly can feel that in Thomasville, and making do of privilege and poverty in Southern history, and that all resonates in the region's food tradition. And you know, that's a history that we really eat every day. You know, I, I think we eat a lot of we eat a lot of fast and a lot of American and a lot of kind of commercial food these days, but sometimes we're right back to kind of to local and to regional. 
you know, but over time, you know, it seems like Southern food has become kind of untethered from the complex historical narrative that's responsible for what we eat as Southerners. And I think of that like buckets of, you know, Southern fried chicken, Kentucky fried chicken, remember that stuff? And like Popeye cathead biscuits, they're like culinary spacecraft set adrift from the mothership of Southern history and culture and experience. Because, you know, really real Southern food is a distinctive, innovative cuisine shaped by indigenous and global cultures within the lands and waters of our region. You know, just consider the historic Southern larder, you know, larder, that's an old fashioned word kind of for pantry that we still treasure today. I think that when y'all look at these images, these aren't foreign foods. You know, you know what these are, they're greens and ramps and butter beans and preserves and pickles and oysters and shrimp. And there's some quail and there's cured ham and wild game there, the quail stone ground grits and peanuts and Carolina gold rice and some sweet potatoes and hot cornbread. The resilience of these foods, the fact that we know what these are, that my students still know what these are, love them and eat them, speaks of the power of a cuisine, and that is Southern foodways. A multi-layered past and present underlies those foods, and that history really explains why Southerners eat the way they do and why we think of these foods as deeply Southern. And you know, and we eat in very different ways. We eat nationally, we eat globally, we eat locally, we eat regionally. You know, we, we live in 2021, we're living through this pandemic. We eat in different ways at different points in our lives. So I'm, I'm largely talking about, you know, our kind of Southern historical selves, the legacy that informs how we eat at, you know, within this place. So, you know, when we examine uh, the South's historic food cultures, what we see, especially in that historic food culture, is the region, is the history of the region's economic system. And that for a long time is a race-based capitalism. A lot of that still exists in our agriculture, but it begins with the very first con in our big agriculture. It begins with the very first contact between European colonizers and traders and Native American people in the Southeast beginning in the late 16th century. One of my former students, a, a young woman named Madison Scott said in my class that the truth of the South is found in moments of collision. And I, I love that phrase. And so tonight I'm gonna take you on a on a journey to give you a quick taste of several of these food related moments over the arc of southern history but we only have a short time so don't worry i'm not going to go on for, for for hours but i'm going to start in the very early south when the europeans first arrived in the american south they encountered the indigenous people of our region you know and they came about the era but, but those people had been here for eons, right? But in that time of the Mississippian period, about 1000 to 1500, the year 1500, they were the South's very first intensive farmers. And agriculture is born in the American South as it is in what, maybe six places around the world, the domestication of, of plants. So from Mesoamerica, maize or corn, became the staple food crop of indigenous people in the region. And we have an archeologist here at UNC named Rachel Briggs, and she calls this the hominy food way. It's not a singular dish, but rather the life sustaining staple food ways for native peoples of the Eastern woodlands. And another colleague of mine, historian Melinda Maynard Lowry, who was at UNC is now teaching at Emory, She's a member of the Lumbee tribe and a scholar of, uh, which is an important tribe here in North Carolina and of Southeastern Indian history. And she said, we should call Southern foodways, Indian foodways, if we wanna ac accurately credit the people who originate it. And we often don't credit those Native American voices in, in our region. So cultural negotiation and exchange, 
between Native Americans, African Americans, and European Americans, both peaceful and embattled, created the South's core cuisine. And a former colleague of mine who I adored, a Southern historian named Charles Joyner, who lived in South Carolina, was from South Carolina. He came up with, he coined a term called the culinary grammar of the American South. And he described food as an expressive language of place. And I think that's so powerful. No region has a louder, more vibrant food voice than the South. And as you guys explore food this fall, you know, there's no better place to do that than in Georgia. Um, so there are key grammatical rules, you know, to this language or to this grammar. And, you know, pigs would be one of them. They're one of the big rules. So pigs arrive with the earliest European explorers, Christopher Columbus, Hernando de Soto. They brought livestock with them on their ships. So they end up in the Caribbean. They end up, you know, in the early Southeast. They are still around, descendants of them. The In our region, in North Carolina, many of my friends raise prized Asaba hogs. I'm sure they do off the coast of Georgia as well. They have good, they're famous for their good, their healthy fat. They're high in fatty acids, omega-3s, and unsaturated fat. So from early on, Southerners chose pork over beef because the region focused on plant, uh, because of its agriculture. Agriculture focused on staple money crops, big plantations, tobacco, cotton, sugar, rice. You weren't going to give up your land for grazing a livestock. And then Europeans, of course, brought with them really invasive crops to the New World, tobacco and wheat. These were often devastating to indigenous food cultures. Uh, Europeans had, no, had a very different idea about land ownership. They figured it was theirs. They cut down forests about property and land ownership. They cleared land where native people had hunted and foraged for, for decades and much longer. They took lands where Indian women had grown corn and squash and beans and greens. And they also brought common European garden plants and fruit trees. And those grew well in the southern climate. They brought those from, from, from Great Britain. Uh, many varieties of greens, collards, called them coleworts, kale, turnip greens, and enslaved Black cooks embraced those southern grown greens. They recognized those greens as they had known and loved in West Africa. So the great triad of southern vegetables that we still love, turnips, turnip greens. I just, I've got turnips and some field peas sitting on my counter in my kitchen that we've been eating for the last few days, um, and lots of greens. Um, sweet potatoes. Field peas or cow peas were brought to the New World by enslaved Africans in the 17th century. It was actually a bean, not a pea. Uh, sweet potatoes came to America from South America. So as you know, to understand Southern food ways, we have to understand that relationship of enslaved, then free people to Africa, to, to, the, to the idea of historical trauma their central role, role in food production, their voice is one of the most poignant and expressive in Southern cuisine. So from West Africa, they brought with them a culinary grammar that's based in cereal grains like rice and millet, and of course the field peas. And they brought cooking methods to the new world too, stewing and boiling and frying in oil and hot fat. And if I want to make sure that you have seen High on the Hog, which is a Netflix series, it just was on this, this summer, uh, featuring Steven Satterfield, produced by these amazing filmmakers that are listed here, and based on this book of the same name, High of the Hog, by Dr. Jessica Harris, who's an amazing historian and, and a food historian. And that series, which is going to continue going, but the first episode begins with Dr. Harris in Benin. Uh, and so it's, it's a, in West Africa. So be sure you, you check that out. So enslaved people in plantations in the American South, certainly, of course, in Georgia, not far from 
where y'all are, we're typically given, you know, a weekly ration of cornmeal, a small amount of cured pork, you know, not high on the hog, but low on the hog, uh, often no meat at all. They supplemented this diet with growing small vegetable gardens, they hunted and fished, they foraged, they gathered wild foods. And they were often given the least desirable parts of hogs and other small livestock. And they were resilient and creative and they transformed those foods into incredible meals for their families that are still part of the legacy of southern food and of african-american food ways and those like you know we can see that here in these foods too this is what we still eat right catfish barbecue um chopped up chopped up pork <laughs> in this way field peas and and greens Staple African American foods remain at the heart of Southern food. You know, I keep showing you these plates that are like my new, kind of New Year's Day plate of food that I prepared, or this is a, a plate of food that I had at my mother in law's a few years ago in Mississippi. And it, it could, you know, that was like 2015, it could be 1915, it could be 1815, it could be 1715 when you look at at these foods. Jessica Harris describes the Africanizing of the Southern plate, and we can see that in this, in this plate. Michael Twitty, who is a really fabulous young African-American culinary historian, he refers to it as the haunted plate, haunted, like H-A-U-N-T-E-D, because that plate has so much to say. There is a deep history that lies within that plate. Uh, another uh, colleague, uh, here are two books by Adrian Miller, who's, these are published by UNC Press, uh, has written about soul food and about the African American pit masters in our country. Um, another a chef that you may be familiar with, Chef Marcus Samuelson of the Red Rooster in Harlem and other, other restaurants there, he defines soul food as comfort food that is a celebration of labor. And Adrian Miller defines it as the urbanized food of African-American Southerners shaped by the great migration out of the South, the black power movement of the 1960s. And this food heritage is really about empowerment and survival. I wanna mention another project too that I know y'all know, the 1619 project that was in the times, you know, just recent, you know, a couple of, was it last year, year before, before the pandemic, uh, overseen by, by journalist um, Nicole Hannah Jones, who attended UNC's uh, journalism school. And that project is designed to reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of Black Americans at the very center of the United States national narrative. And many, Several of those pieces in the original 1619 project talked about food. And Nicole Hannah Jones talks about food and her families and her African American heritage history in Mississippi. So I'll I'll take us to the Antebellum plantocracy. You know, where meals of the white elite were prepared and served by enslaved cooks and laborers. Now those voices throughout the 19th century, after freedom even, and into the 20th century, were often silenced and little recognized in the canon of Southern cuisine, just like indigenous voices also. Um, there's some really important work by my colleague and friend, journalist, writer, Tony Tipton Martin, who has countered the erasure of black voices in two award-winning books, which you can also get, I'm sure, at your bookstore downtown in Thomasville. Jemima Code, which is a collection of really important voices of African American writers, chefs, caterers, cooks, and Jubilee, which is a fabulous cookbook of kind of, you know, great two centuries of African American American cooking. So back to that plantation table, I, I want to share with you, I found some letters from a young woman who wrote them in the 1850s who was from Massachusetts. I found these letters in an archive in Michigan. 
at the University of, of Michigan. And they were written by Ruth Hastings, who was this young woman. She was in South Carolina as a tutor and a nanny for a wealthy cotton planters. And she wrote home frequently. And she was one of these people kind of like me that writes and talks about food. She described a typical noon meal to her sister, Mary. And they were very modest people back home in Massachusetts, you know? And so it must have felt like she was in Alice in Wonderland and another world. She said for dinner, which was at noon, always the first some kind of soup, then two or three kinds of meat, two or three, some fresh meat. Today, this was had to be kind of springtime, chicken pie, ham, new potatoes, beets, onions, peas, rice. They eat with meat as we do potatoes, often sweet potatoes, lettuce. Then for dessert today, Mrs. W, Mrs. Williams, made a sherry, a cherry Charlotte, hot bread, yeast rolls. And in another letter, Hastings noted, there's the picture of the little cherry, what a cherry Charlotte looks like, all molded and amazing. In another letter, Hastings noted the racial etiquette of her new home. She said, you can't imagine how strange it looks to me to see the children in Serena, they give the Negroes, about the house, a biscuit or a wafer, a piece of gingerbread half eaten by the family or a piece of melon from which all that I call good had been eaten. And she said, I haven't learned yet how to give my leavings with a good grace. She's a New Englander and she's watching, she's watching, watching this racism, watching these racial practices and, and can't quite get with with the program there within the family. So after the Civil War, sharecropping and tenant farming came to the South, certainly the region where y'all are as well. Planters were forced to divide their estates and large farms into smaller pieces. We know what happened with much land ownership and the kind of the winter resorts that happened in Thomasville, but smaller pieces elsewhere, like in Eastern North Carolina, were rented to African American freedmen and poor whites to work those that land. Sharecroppers depended on store credit, and they purchased the cheapest selling food, poor quality flour and cornmeal. It was shipped in from the Midwest. Salt pork shipped it pork. People weren't even eating their own pork. Um, molasses, canned goods. The Southern diet was very very difficult and lean in this time for, for working poor people. And they public health doctors referred to the three M's, this diet of impoverishment that was based on meat, you know, the cheapest cuts of pork, mill, cornmeal, not locally grown, but shipped in from the Midwest, and molasses would have been the best thing in that diet. And that diet was deficient in essential vitamins and better pro in the lean protein that we need. And it led to thousands of cases of pellagra, which is a disease caused by the lack of niacin or vitamin B3. Um, and black families uh, who owned land and farmed were unable to, to secure um, USDA crop loans and were denied access to government farm programs. And we all know about that. This later became a massive case against the USDA, the Pigvert case, uh, but it was expressions of institutional structural racism locked into place by the early 20th century. And there was a lot of increase in black land loss. Many rural Southerners moved to towns and cities. They were seeking jobs and in new industries here in North Carolina, largely and textile mills, furniture mills, logging. And they participated in a natural, a national consumer culture and mass market where you could suddenly, you know, buy stuff at the store, you know. Uh, and there were a lot of Dixie, literally Dixie branded products, you know, that speak of kind of white nationalism and white identity. Uh, in the early 20th century, kind of a branding uh, and selling of a white mythologized uh, 
uh, South, of a, of a mythic South, of a romanticized and kind of sentimentalized South, of a loyal white South. We see that on those bags of flowers here in this photograph by Dorothea Lange. So it was an era of canned goods and commercial bread and refrigeration and manufactured ice and growing cities and new cars and new interstate highways and growing tourism. That was what was happening in Georgia and Florida and people were making their ways down those highways to those tourist cities, Charleston, to winter resorts, taking the train to its final stop there where, where, it, where it was in, in Thomasville too. Thousands of African-Americans left the South. Uh, they began an exodus in 1915 during World War I. It continued in the 1970s. Many ended up in Tulsa. And just this year, we've been you know, noting, commemorating the terrible uh, murder and devastation and coup that happened to the well-to-do African-American community, commercial community that lived, that were in Tulsa in the 1920s. And many of these kind of coups against, uh, against well, middle-class Blacks occurred across the South and, and throughout, throughout our country. So in Chicago and Detroit and Los Angeles and New York and St. Louis, you know, you could see uh, patches of field peas and yellow squash and collards and snap beans in people's backyards was evidence of that kind of African-American Southerners and that diaspora. Black owned cafes and street stands and farm trucks with Southern produce and food products were on the streets of Harlem and Chicago and Kansas City and Washington DC. It gave people a taste of the home for where they had left. So beginning in the 1940s and continuing through the 50s and the 60s, lunch counters across the region, cafes, they became battlegrounds for the civil rights movement. Sit-in protesters became steadfast soldiers in the fight for the most basic of civil rights, this, to have access to public accommodations, facilities, restaurants included, beaches, libraries, movies, schools, and more. The Historic Civil Rights Act finally passed in 1964. And uh, I have that here in front of a picture of Hop's Barbecue. One of my students, probably about the time that Amelia was in school here, wrote about her grandfather who owned Hop's Barbecue, and this was segregated, and he would not, he would not integrate that restaurant. He happily served African American friends and and workers out of that back door, but he would not integrate it, and so it became a site of pretty violent protest uh, when. In a pro uh, during a protest in the early in the early part of the year in the 1964, but again that Civil Rights Act passed and he reluctantly had to integrate, you know, later later that year. So President Lyndon Johnson's introduction of the Great Society campaign, his war on poverty, that began to introduce all Americans to hunger within its own borders. National exposure of Southern hunger and poverty reached its zenith during a tour of Mississippi led by Senator Robert Kennedy from New York and Senator Joseph Clark from Pennsylvania. That happened in 1967. And then as we all know, the appearance of hunger and malnutrition in the South began to change in the 1970s. It really began to change radically. Impoverished, low-income Americans who had suffered from a lack of calories, right? They could not get enough the absence of food, it transitioned to another form of malnutrition, which is obesity. Too many calories found in the wrong food, in cheap, processed, commercial, fast food often, with little or no nutritive value, but a lot of calories, but just nothing, nothing good for you. By the 1980s, our region, farming across the South really was synonymous with big poultry, and turkey and chicken and eggs and big pork. That's that's the story in North Carolina. Uh, and here, besides pork, agribusiness is now largely dominated by in soybeans and peanuts, as well as sweet potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers. And Mexican and Central American workers 
became the predominant labor force for these large agro processors. And then things were countered to, to that big ag. Of course, a young generation of people in the 1970s and the 1980s responded to industrial agriculture across our country. You think of the movement of kind of the counterculture, the heavy, pushing against that heavily processed American diet. And we see this movement of small scale farming, a vision of local sustainable food, farmers markets, uh, food, small food aggregators across the South really began to happen. And we began to see local partnerships between many of those young people. And these folks are really like my age now, but they were young farmers and chefs back in the 1980s. And I know Amelia knows who they are. Uh, Ken and Ben Barker owned the fabulous Magnolia Grill restaurant in Durham, and they were best friends and partnered in their work with farmers Alex and Betsy Hitt, who just recently retired, but are still continuing to, to, to farm. And I think a, a good example would be sweetgrass dairy, you know, in Thomasville, too. And when you look at the work of that incredible family and their children and how they made a switch from kind of conventional dairy farming to rotating pasture raised cows on their farm to create and and really revive and bring and, and create a cheese industry again, a small sustainable cheese industry in the South. And I remember at the Southern Foodways Alliance when the sweet grass cheeses arrived there at our conferences and everybody was blown away by local cheeses being made in the South again. And we have, we see that in, in our region here too. Um, Southern foodways have really been transformed by the labor and the vision and the creativity of a new generation of immigrants made possible to changing immigration laws in the 1960s, Asian, Latinx, uh, immigrants from India uh, and South Asia have come to the South following the passage of that legislation. Um, now, second and third generation immigrant Southerners are food entrepreneurs, they're journalists, they're policymakers, they're scholars, they're strong stakeholders in our communities. Um, Amelia knows too that food studies have really exploded across our region as they have across America. But because we have such a strong food voice in the South, I think the study of food ways in our region is almost stronger than it is any other place in the country. And I'm sure you see that the Southern food movement, I'm seeing it here in North Carolina, where I live in Chapel Hill and in the Piedmont, it's largely led by a next generation of young and mid-career people, more and more women, more black, indigenous, and people of color among its leadership. But what a what a time I'm wrapping up here because what a time we have all been through, and maybe what a wake-up call to the food and to the local, to the to caring for and valuing the local food systems of where we are, kind of taking us back. It's a very full circle moment in lockdown and the pandemic and COVID. And to go back and realize that we must have local food systems because when national food systems and global food systems collapse, we know we've got to do something quick and big and important. The pandemic, the immigration crisis, the deep political rifts within our country, climate change across the world and across our region um, are, have, were really unimaginable in the past. And today we see how they threaten our local food systems. So our greatest challenge today is really seeking, I think, food justice, food equity, and access, access for all stakeholders in Southern food. And as I was saying, in restoring and rebuilding those vital local food systems that earlier Southerners really knew and understood, not all had access to equally. So we've got a lot of work, a lot of work ahead of us. Um, I wanna, just as I'm, as I'm ending here, just to share 
a few images of Mill Pond because I said I'd, I'd spent a little time. I've been twice to Mill Pond with my husband, Bill Ferris, who went to school when was chums with, with Ellery Sedgwick, whose people were the, the founders of, of Mill Pond, you know, and as you know, it was fabulous winter home for the for the Wade family. It was built by Jephthah Homer Wade the second on land he began acquiring near debt and it's so close to downtown Thomasville in 1903. And I'm just going to show you I when I've gone, we've gone in January and we went last we went January of 2020 for a few days right before everything locked down and what a glorious time that was. And I've and there is my husband Bill in the jeans there on the kind of in the blue t-shirt with his friends and Ellery there next to him. They all went to high school together. And there we are in the middle of that beautiful, you know, just incredible mill pond uh, where, you know, oh, just camellias. And the food ways that are celebrated there, the, the dogs, the handlers, the talented staff, the drivers, the, you know, the, the, the cooks uh, were so impressive in how they presented the cuisine, the hospitality, the culture, the history of labor, the history of these winter resorts. Um, and, and just seeing it in the material culture, of course, of the table, of of the of the dinnerware and of the the vast amount of dinnerware for for different courses different luncheon dinner you know uh wear and dinnerware and and breakfast and so so beautiful and the the flora and the fauna uh and history of those food worlds and landscapes reflected again on the table in, in very powerful ways. A great oyster <laughs> served so beautifully. More of that of that incredible dinnerware in that in that setting. Incredible talent, wonderful collards and hush puppies one day. I think that was with some shrimp and grits. I learned so much from from sitting with these guides and talented, incredible men who train and care for these animals and drive them. And, and because I study the Jewish South, when I went into town, I was so excited to see B'nai Israel Synagogue as well. So I'm going to stop, stop there and um, hope we can, we can talk a little bit more. All right, thank you very much, Marcy. That was fascinating. And of course, I hope everybody ate dinner because everything looked delicious. <laughs> um, and I, I, I've obviously, full, you know, full confession, I'm not a Southerner, right? I'm from Chicago and Miami. So I'm the ultimate Yankee, as I always say, but I think I appreciate, um, appreciate the food, obviously, and appreciate the ties back to really what it takes, like you said. I mean, when I moved here, I was really excited about the opportunities that I had to eat locally. I, I, I suspect I could have eaten locally in Miami if I'd, you know, maybe tried or made made somewhat of an effort. But it's actually quite easy to do in Thomasville and quite quite pleasant to do. And really in small towns like like Monticello and and um, yeah. you know, places around. So I know. I mean, I have one question, but then I know Amelia's probably got some. If you have any questions in the Not chat, yet. but Go okay, ahead, let me. Yeah. So my question is, I always fear that there's this like threshold from, a, for instance, a sweet grass, which we all have been to, we love, it's delicious. And um, I know I was talking to them recently about something we're gonna do with them and they were pointing out that they've built a big new facility. Uh, a, I'm not sure what it, if it's where they make their cheese or what, but anyways, they've made some advancements and they're building this great new facility and that sounds great and that's all wonderful. But I always sort of worry about that, um, that threshold from where a small, you know, um, just wonderfully curated, locally focused place, you know, either makes the jump and becomes big and loses, and I'm not saying that's gonna happen, let's let that won't happen, hopefully that won't happen, 
um, makes that jump to a larger, perhaps commercial um, enterprise. I mean, is that sort of like inevitable for a lot of small places or is there, are there examples of, let's just call it a sweet grass, if you will, in places where, you know, they have managed to go through from the big, it's, it's or origins or 50, 60, a hundred years ago and keep that small cultivated sort of taste and yeah. feel. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, you know, and I, I don't really think I know the answer. I, I can kind of point to uh, Chapel Hill Creamery here in Chapel Hill, uh, right here in, in Orange County, and that's run by two amazing women, and those are, uh, you know, Derek from Dairy Cows as well, and that's, that's pretty, they've kept it pretty small, but, you know, that is, that is challenging in itself. Um, you know, because I totally understand the desire of Sweetgrass to, to bring it up enough to scale that they can support a couple of generations of family and more and make, and that is, that's unusual. And that's actually pretty powerful. I'm ex, I was reading a little bit about them online today and in seeing some of the growth that, that you're expressing, but, you know, for the most part, I think small Entre food entrepreneurship, locally owned food entrepreneurship, kind of in the craft or artisan food world, at least what I'm seeing in North Carolina, it's small <laughs> and it's local. And, and that's, and, and, and that's, and, and they've been very much in need during the pandemic. So, you know, it's, that I, I I think if we can if we can really support help support people to rebuild these local food economies, that's the best thing you can hope for. And if and if they get too big, you know. Yeah, I mean it's, it's not a I guess it's, it's not inevitable. And we all use yeah. we all we go we all go to chain places. Those those places are it's inevitable. You know, you use those types of establishments, but um just something that I always clicks in my friend who owns a small bakery and I always tell her you should build, make more of them and she's like nope I don't want to she wants to just have that one and then right. finally I stopped bugging her because you know she'll she's doing it right and she's successful yeah. and just leave it at that so yeah, so yeah I mean yeah that's a great point sorry we have a couple of comments online yeah a couple of comments in the chat um one from Hale McCollum um she says direct consumer sales for our local food entrepreneurs has changed the game for sweetgrass as well as Shermer pecans, both of whom are yeah. clients of Hales Fontaine Mori. Yeah. So that's one way that yeah. small places just or direct to consumer online sales. She cater, cater yeah. to their, you know, 3,000 people that, that live in this county. That is huge, right? The ability to finally sell direct to consumer is a big deal. I mean, social media and social platforms have changed everything, you know, and I mean, that's, I, I access my food. I think we all, like you said, you know, and we, we use some, we probably go to some chains, we go to some local, we go to farmers, you know, like there are lots of different ways we, we, we have our food landscapes look very different. I, I don't think anybody, well, you know, I have some folks that are religious about only shopping at the farmer's market, but it won't work for me, you know, just to do that. So I'm like, do the best you can, you know, like we get a we, we get a CSA and we pick it up once a week. And it's, it's great because I can never make it to the Saturday market, you know. Well, and I did hear recently that I gave a tour to somebody at Lapham Patterson who said that I think Hubs and Hops is going to be doing like a weekend farmer's market or something. So mm -hmm. there's some folks locally who are there is a local CS, CSA program. I think it's Red Hills Farm. Yeah, so there's something, some good, I think, yeah. good opportunities locally. Yeah. yeah. So did anybody else in the uh, Maryland you have a question? I want to say thank you. That was excellent and very um, informative. But I want to know what classes you taught Amelia. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. Uh, we, my friends and I used to joke because I had a few friends who were all in the same track that um, we, we majored in Marcy Ferris. We didn't major Aww. in Southern. So. <laughs> we majored in Marcy Ferris. They just <laughs> major in Southern studies. Um, I they, think Marcy's. So go ahead, Marcy. 
Yeah, well, they were really, they're great. They were great young women scholars. Of, they're now all like public history people, which is so impressive to me. And so we did a lot, what did we do? Material culture, Southern studies. Food waste. Food waste. And Southern Jewish history. I think Kelly was in with you for Southern Jewish women's history yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, it's great. A lot. <laughs> Spent a lot of time. Well, we're sorry you couldn't be here in person, but do you want to stick around and watch us eat some, eat some cake? Blue, uh, <laughs> black, blackberry jam cake? Well, y'all enjoy. Enjoy. That's it, it's kind of perfect for this time of year because you know, jam cakes are a very southern cake. And you know, you don't have to use blackberry jam. You could use a fig jam, you could use whatever, whatever's around that you love, but it's it became like this Jewish high holiday cake for our family because my mom got the recipe from one of her non-Jewish friends in Northeastern Arkansas in Blyville where I grew up. And it was perfect for high holidays, you know, for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you wanna have something after, you know, you've been in, been in temple and worshiping and it just, it's moist and wonderful. So I, I hope you guys enjoy that. I, I think we will. Oh, we got, sorry, we got another question here from Randy. Yeah, did uh, Native Americans convert field corn into hominy? And if so, how did they do that? Wow, yes, they did. And it's, I don't know if you saw, you probably know about this process, nixtamalization, right? Where to make the, the, chemical the to make the it bioavailable to our bodies you have to treat it with some kind of a, a, a lime product and so that's what nixtamalization does and it breaks down the corn so that it becomes bioavailable to the to our bodies but you know it was what Briggs talks about is that and and not all in, indigenous people knew that, but not all white Southerners knew that about, or or had that kind of lost that technology, and and corn was was not as nutritious to them. I mean, that's that's the problem with the with the the manufactured uh, cornmeal that has like no nutrition in it that comes from the Midwest, and um, but you know there were other forms, you know other ways of eating the corn within that hominy food way as well. There's a comment from some uh, from John Sprague who says these topics would make great culinary food tours in our region. Yeah. Oh. Deborah Smith is listening. She can <laughs> add that to her. We do have somebody that does a local food tour. Uh, well, kind of food slash history tour, I guess. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting to have a little bit of a perspective on what we're eating and why we're eating it and uh, for people to remain open minded. I still have to, you know, I'm quite sure if my all my northern brethren came down, they'd be weirded out by <laughs> too much sweet tea or something like that. But they could they could figure it out. So and actually, I worked for the Seminole Indians for a number of years. And it's they still I mean, collard greens and um, yeah. Just, uh, it, totally similar lines along the food ways. So that's fascinating. So, yeah. Well, thank you for joining us from afar. Well, and um, I think this will line up nicely with, again, going to be November for our next topic. Sorry, folks. But actually, let me side note about that is because one of our presenters who owns a local restaurant, George of George and Louis, wasn't able to make it during the regular work week because this labor shortage issue is actually quite a hot, or I yeah. want to say timely topic, and he's not able to get away from the restaurant to come do a presentation. Yeah. So we have to do it on a Sunday when he can get there. And just interesting, totally separate topic. We won't talk about that right now, yeah. but it is definitely hit all the way into little old Thomasville. So yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But we may send you, if we have more questions after tonight, we'll pass them along through Amelia. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Amelia. It's such a pleasure to be with y'all tonight. And I look forward to, to following the events that, that, that come in the fall. And, and a, you have a Perlu event too, right? Yes. Yes. The right. ultimate 
event in Thomasville, Chicken oh, Peru. God, it's so good. It's so good. And boy, that's got a deep history too. Yeah, it does. Well, thank well, you all for having me. Stay safe, everybody. Stay strong. Eat local. Thank you. Okay. Bye.